Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, January 24th, 2022, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. We had a very busy uh, uh, Sunday night show, so go back and watch that one. All right, calling numbers 313-778-7600. Is the call in number if you have a question or comment? Okay, so there was a story that I saw. Uh, we were actually going to talk about it on Roland Martin Unfiltered when I was on Friday, and we did not get a chance to really get to this story. And this comes out of um, Illinois, okay, the Chicago area, and this deals with uh, restrictive covenants. Have you heard of restrictive covenants? Restrictive covenants or racial restrictive covenants were written into the deeds uh, for home ownership going back to the 1920s and 30s and 40s, things like this. And they stipulated that the house could never be sold to uh, a non-white person, especially an African-American. And this was one of the ways that was utilized to lock African-Americans out of home ownership and uh, creating generational wealth through home ownership, in addition to redlining and things like this. So there's a there's a story from the New York Times from January 20th, 2022. Illinois homeowners can now remove racist clauses from their property deeds. Illinois homeowners can now remove racist clauses from their property deeds. With a now, this is about a new law in Illinois, and it was signed into law by uh Governor uh JB Pritzker uh in July of 2021. And there was a story also from um uh, ABC Channel 7 in Chicago back on January 7th dealing with this. So we're, we're going to talk some about this. Now, this intersects with a article that I posted um, on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network um, today. And a lot of people, you know, we, we, we talked a lot about Dr. King during um, Dr. King Day week not just Dr. King Day, but Dr. King Week. And we're going to continue dealing with some history of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., especially going into February African American History Month, or what some people call Black History Month, because his, he, uh, he's very, very much misunderstood. He very, uh, he's very much misunderstood. And um, I wish people would like read some of the books that Dr. King actually wrote like stride toward freedom which is his first book which is about the montgomery bus boycott but um a lot of people in talking about dr king forget that dr king came up north in 1966 to fight for fair housing in chicago and august 5th 1966 he gets attacked and, and stoned during a protest of chicago for fair housing OK, this is before the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Uh, and this is a picture of Dr. King being attacked here. So we're going to talk some about this because these stories intersect the, 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 the story dealing with the racist covenants, uh, the, ra the the restrictive covenants in Illinois. And even though they're illegal now, there's still deeds, old deeds from the 50s. Uh, 30s, 40s, even 60s that still exists that still have that language in the deeds. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Then there was this um, I, back in 2014, I talked about this story from the Atlantic.com. And this deals with uh, inside the battle for fair housing in, in, in 1960s Chicago inside the battle for fair housing in 1960s Chicago. And this is part, this story here from the Atlantic.com was part of a larger 
uh, story from Tanya Hesse Coates that dealt with the case for reparations, okay, in 2014. So uh, the Atlantic.com has this piece here, uh, Inside the Battle for Fair Housing in the 1960s. And it talks about some African Americans who um, ended up owning homes in Chicago, but what they had to go through to homes. When Clyde Ross, Maddie Lewis, and Ethel Weatherspoon settled in the West Side neighborhood of North Lawndale, they hoped to achieve the American dream of owning a home. At the time, however, federal policies, at the time, however, federal policies known as redlining, now federal policy, this is the U.S. government, Okay, federal policies known as redlining prevented African Americans from getting real mortgages, forcing them to buy from real estate speculators on what is called on contract. On contract, this was a, a way that was utilized from for, by white landowners to exploit African Americans, especially many of them moving from from down south up north looking for a better way of life and looking for home ownership. The contracts homeowners soon discovered turned out to be a scam. The contracts homeowners soon discovered turned out to be a scam. So this is a short documentary, it's about nine or 10 minutes, um, that deals with this history. And uh, it, it talks about uh, Clyde Ross and Maddie Lewis and at the Weatherspoon, and a community organizer named Jack McNamara, they recount the story of how they formed the Contract Buyers League of Chicago and fought back against these predatory uh, real estate uh, uh, owners. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about this as well. This is all connected. This is all con connected and. Uh, things like the study from the Brookings Institute uh, that deals with how the uh, value of African-American homes is valued at uh, $43,000, $48,000, $48,000 less on average than average white homes. And cumulatively, African-American homes are valued at $156 billion less than comparable white homes, and this is called the segregation tax, which then impacts negatively impacts the um, racial wealth disparity and uh, helps to cripple African-Americans being able to accumulate wealth to pass on to future generations. This piece here that we've talked about before from Curbed.com, how a segregation tax is costing black American homeowners $156 billion. This is from November 27th, 2018. From November 27th, 2018. How a segregation tax is costing black homeowners $156 billion. A new Brookings Gallup report, Brookings Institute and Gallup, the survey people, a new Brookings Gallup report finds residential property in majority black neighborhoods is consistently undervalued. So we'll, we'll talk about this um, on today's show. And then um, today is February 24th. Today is the birthday of Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo uh, Alfonso Schomburg, who was Afro-Puerto Rican, and was a historian, and he's one of the fathers of African American history, Black history, uh, et cetera. Okay, we'll talk some about uh, the Afro Puerto Rican Arturo uh, Schomburg, who the Schomburg Library is named after. All right, if you've heard of the Schomburg Library, it's named after Arturo Schomburg. Okay, now on the uh, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. 
Okay, stand by. Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. All right, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. All right, stand by. Stand by. The computer is freezing up on me. All right. We're back from break. Stand by, everybody. Back from break in two minutes. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. It's a call in the number if you have a question or comment. Back from breaking one minute. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, January 24th, 2022, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, uh, email me at AHN show at africanhistorynetwork.com ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com we know african american history month is coming up black history month and that fantastic presentations dealing with the origins of black history month and and a number of other things as well so email me at ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com and we can make that happen okay um let's jump into this first topic here so i saw we're going to clip one uh shakita in just a second Okay, so I, I saw this story uh, from uh, NBC, uh, from uh, New York Times. Saw this story from New York Times from January twentieth, twenty twenty two. Illinois uh, homeowner, uh, Illinois homeowners can now remove racist clauses from their property deeds with a new law, Illinois. Uh, joins over a dozen states that have made it easier to remove racial restrictive covenants, which were used to bar people of certain races from buying homes, especially African Americans. This was targeting us, okay? Especially African Americans. All right, this was targeting us. All right, now uh, there's a piece also from. Uh, ABC Channel 7 that I'm going to go to here in just a second as well. So a new law in um, a new law in Illinois allows homeowners to change their housing deeds 
to remove racist clauses that were used to bar people of certain races and religious groups from buying homes or living in a particular neighborhood. The clauses which are known as racial restrictive covenants were outlawed under the Fair Housing Act of 1968, but they remain buried in unknown in an unknown number of property documents across the United States. They remain buried in an unknown number of property documents across the United States. Relics of a broader effort by the real estate uh, by, by the real estate industry, federal housing authorities, and individual homeowners to prevent integration, to prevent integration. And we're going to see these continue to be used even after World War II ends. And we, we've talked about here on this show uh, dealing with uh, the GI Bill and how African Americans, uh, 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 how African American World War II veterans were uh, discriminated when it came to the GI Bill and buying homes. Not just buying homes, but getting low interest loans to start businesses and go and, and getting money to go to school, but especially in buying homes. OK, and we, if we look at this piece here from uh, History dot com official website of the History Channel, how the GI Bill's promise was denied to a million black World War II veterans. The sweeping bill promised prosperity to veterans. So why didn't black Americans benefit? And one of the things it talks about in here is the um, uh, discrimination when it came to buying homes, okay, and using uh, the uh, GI Bill to get low interest loans, especially in the newly uh, in the in the suburbs that were being built, suburbs post World War II that were being built, and we're being uh, discriminated against uh, in trying to buy those homes. A white post World War a, a white post-war housing boom and redlining in black neighborhoods. The post-war housing boom almost entirely excluded black Americans, most of whom remained in cities that received less and less investment from businesses and banks. Though the GI Bill guaranteed low interest mortgages and other loans, they were not administered by the Veterans Affairs Office itself. Thus, the VA could co-sign but not actually guarantee the loans. This gave white this gave white uh, run financial institutions free reign to refuse mortgages and loans to African Americans. Okay, so read the rest of uh, this piece here from uh, History.com. Okay, now if we go back to uh, this article from the uh, New York Times. Okay, in many states, it can be arduous, if not impossible, to remove the uh, racial covenants from property records, prompting states such as Illinois to pass laws that streamline the process. As of January 1st, 2022, homeowners in the, in the state can submit a request to their county recorder to remove the racial covenants. The cost per request is capped at $10. Since 2018, at least 13 states have passed laws to make it easier to remove racial covenants from deeds. A bill to do so in New York is pending in the state legislature. Now, one of the first people to request modification in Illinois was Nicole Sullivan, okay, Nicole Sullivan, um, who has been trying to change her deed since around 2011, when she bought a house in Lake County in the northeastern corner of the state of Illinois. Um, Nicole Sullivan's homeowners association had sent her a copy of the deed dated March 1929. The deed was dated March 1929, to explain why she could not create a fenced off area for her dog on the property. She was intrigued by the document, then alarmed when she found a clause stipulating that the house could never be sold to 
or occupied by, quote, any person or persons of the African or Negro, Japanese, Chinese, Jewish, or Hebrew races or their descendants. Now, I want to go to this clip here from ABC Channel 7 uh, in Chicago. And uh, because Nicole Sullivan was interviewed for this piece. Let's go to clip one, Shakita. Okay. Um, all right. We'll get it queued up. And most people were pretty embarrassed that we had these. When Nicole Sullivan moved into her neighborhood in unincorporated Mundeline about 10 years ago, she discovered a restrictive covenant in her property deed. It was written decades ago, aimed at barring people of African, Japanese, Chinese, and Jewish descent from moving in. It's troubling to know, like, gosh, how many people have bought a house in our neighborhood and learned this way after the fact. Racial restrictive covenants were contractual agreements by a group of property owners or developers to keep certain groups out. They were outlawed after a 1948 Supreme Court decision, but the practice continued until the Fair Housing Act in 1968. Northwestern University professor Floyd Thurston authored a book on housing discrimination in the 20th century. If you have a house that was built before 1950, there's a pretty good chance that there's a restrictive covenant in the deed, um, particularly if that was a neighborhood hey, that girls. Fresh face for home. Um, predominantly white. This week, Sullivan became the first person in Lake County, likely in Illinois, to file a restrictive covenant modification. She submitted her request to the Recorder of Deeds office in the county. Sullivan is credited with pushing for legislation in Springfield to allow homeowners to remove racist language from their property needs. That law taking effect just days ago. This is something that should have been changed a long time ago, decades ago. Changing the language on one's deeds is minimal in terms of affecting overall contemporary patterns of discrimination um, or uh, practices of discrimination, but it's still an important symbolic step. Sullivan says she wanted to make her neighborhood a more welcoming place and be a positive example for her children. People need to realize that you do have a voice, you do have power. Lake County officials say Sullivan should have a decision on her request soon. Will Jones, ABC7, Eyewitness News. Okay. All right. That's from ABC, uh, ABC Channel 7 in Chicago. All right. Now, Professor Clo uh, uh, Chloe uh, Thurston, an assistant professor of political science at Northwestern University, uh, who you heard in the clip there, an author uh, who authored a book on housing discrimination in the 20th century, titled at the boundaries of home ownership credit discrimination and the american state said quote if you have a house that was built before 1950 there's a pretty good chance that there is a restrictive covenant in the deed particularly if that was a neighborhood that was historically predominantly white this is one of the ways that they kept those neighborhoods predominantly white white restrictive covenants redlining when it came to making loans from banks and the uh federal housing uh administration different tactics like this we'll continue this on the other side of the break we'll also talk about when dr king went to chicago in 1966 to fight for fair housing and we'll talk about alturo uh alfonso schomburg whose birthday is today you listen to the african history network show on michael m hotel we'll be back in a few minutes Stand by, back from breaking four minutes. All right, stand by everybody. All right, who still needs to register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power? 
1865 to 1968. And ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Well, I'll post some information here. You can register for the class. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. Even after the class is over, if you still have access to the full class. All right, stand by. Back from breaking two minutes. Education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. There's going to be laws and policies that take advantage of You control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. <laughs> 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, the Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is uh, Monday, January 24th, 2022, and we are live. Call the numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment okay um you can still register for the online classes i teach on saturdays and sundays from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 and ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school okay um we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch them anytime they're regularly $130 uh, each. We have a special bundle pack going on for a few more days. You can register for both classes for only $70. Okay, so we just posted the link here, and it's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, I want to go back to uh, this story here, and I want to go to um, this clip from The Atlantic dealing with um, fair housing in um, – dealing with the fair housing battle in Chicago. We're going to go to that here in just a second. So this, um, this story from the New York times, uh, is tied to history and it's tied to a legacy of racism and discrimination, housing, discrimination, etc., which is a legacy of slavery in this country also. Okay. Uh, I'm going to send this to you, uh, Shakita. So cue this, uh, cue this clip up, please. Now, if we go back to this article, then I want to go to the story dealing with uh, Dr. King and the uh, in Chicago in 1966, fighting for fair housing. Because oftentimes, 
you know, when the, the when we celebrate Dr. King Day, things like that usually get left out uh, of the discussion. They, the, Dr. King gets reduced to this lovable, sweet old man that everybody loves, but most of America hated when he was assassinated. He was the most hated man in America. So they deal with the Santa Clausification of Dr. King, as, as Cornell West calls it. Um, if we go back to this piece here from the New York Times. So Nicole Sullivan, who is white and a and a neighbor, tried to have language removed, but kept hitting roadblocks. Eventually, they approached state representative Daniel Dedick, a Democrat from Buffalo Grove, who with the state senator, Adrian Johnson, also a Democrat from Buffalo Grove, sponsored legislation to allow changes in the Illinois General Assembly. Governor J.B. Pritzker signed the bill into law in July of 2021. And they have uh, a port they have a portion of uh, Nicole Sullivan's deed here with the racial covenant in it. Now, Nicole Sullivan, who's 41 year years old, said that the said the law change was largely a symbolic victory and that there was much more to do to improve housing equity in her community. And across the United States, but she hoped the law would help make her neighborhood more diverse. She said, we're stopping, quote, we're stopping this cycle of recycling this language back into our community. So no longer will new community members interested in putting up a fence have to read about how their ancestors would not allow what would, would, would not have been allowed to be there, she said. Now, it is difficult to know how many property documents in the United States use racial covenants because they are in private agreements. They're in the deeds. They're, they're in private agreements. There are local efforts underway in many cities and counties, including Cook County, to find and catalog these records. Now, a, a study by Lake Forest College in Lake Forest, Illinois, found that by the late 1940s, more than 220 subdivisions in Cook County had created or adopted racial restrictive covenants. Okay, by the late 1940s, so this is after World War II, which ends in 1945, and we're gonna see the baby boomer generation, we're gonna see the, the suburbs being created, we're going to see the Federal Housing uh, Administration uh, uh, they, 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 you see that you see the federal housing, uh, uh, the, the, the federal housing act of, uh, about 1947, which allows white people to put, uh, 3% down on low interest loans and get houses built out in the newly formed suburbs and African-Americans largely get discriminated when it comes to that. Okay. Um, quote, this subdivision is restricted to use by persons of the Caucasian race read an agreement recorded in September 1946 after World War II ends. See, we're going to see this real explosion after World War II. Then we're going to see the um, U.S. Interstate Highway Acts of 1952 and 1956 that drive 41,000 miles of U.S. interstate highways all across the country. They run through about 1,600 African-American communities because the suburbs are being formed. And you have a, you have a deindustrialization of the inner city and these plants and businesses and this infrastructure is being, being moved out to the suburbs and African-Americans are being locked into the inner cities. Quote, this subdivision is restricted to use by persons of the Caucasian race. Read an agreement recorded in September 1946. This restriction shall not apply to domestic servants. End quote. Now, nobody had filed to modify their property record in Cook County as of Wednesday afternoon. Um, so they're talking about this article is from January 20th. So they're talking about the yeah, uh, Wednesday, January 19th. Uh, Sally D uh, Daly, the deputy clerk of communications for the Cook County clerk's office, said in an email. Now, uh, Chloe uh, Thurston, an assistant professor of political science at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, said the use of racial covenants expanded after a 1917 
a Supreme Court decision that made it illegal for cities to designate neighborhoods for specific racial groups, but they did not apply to private contracts. They did not apply to private contracts. So this is a way to get around it, the private contracts. Racial restrictive covenants were then used by realtors and federal housing authorities to prevent integration. In 1927, Nathan Williams, Nathan William, Nathan William uh, McChesney, in 1927, Nathan William McChesney, a prominent lawyer, wrote a model racial restrictive covenant for the Chicago Real Estate Board that targeted only African Americans. The Federal Housing Administration also recommended that racial restrictive covenants be included in homes that it insured. This is the federal government. This is discrimination from the federal government. Now, in 1948, the Supreme Court made existing racial restrictive covenants unenforceable, but the U.S. Supreme Court ruling of Shelley versus Kramer did not entirely stop them from being used. 20 years later, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 made new covenants illegal okay uh i want to go to this clip here this deals with the fight for fair housing in chicago the story of the contract buyers league let's go to this clip shakita and uh mostly everyone that was black they had been sold a contract. If you missed the payment in three months, they could take the property back. No lawyer, no nothing could help you. That was it. There are blocks like this scattered throughout the Lawndale section of Chicago's West Side Ghetto. The people who live here bought their homes from real estate speculators at double or triple their value. And they bought on contract because they couldn't get conventional or FHA mortgages. Under the contract, the buyer makes installment payments at high interest, but he bills no equity. If he defaults on even one payment at any time during the contract, he loses the property and everything he's paid into it. We'll pay towards this thousand, and the house is worth twelve thousand. That means I was overcharged quite a bit, and the contract situation was so bad until uh. Well, there was something broke down, you had to fix it. Uh, you had to pay your water and gas and electric and the taxes and everything else. But you had ownership. How could we be charged like that if that wasn't a law? And how would it, the law let them do this? But they said it was a property. They had a choice to sell it at whatever price they wanted to. And if you bought it, then that was on you. Okay, pause it right there, Skeeter. Pause it right there. Okay, now, uh, th this is Clyde Ross. We're going to come back to Clyde Ross. One of the things Clyde Ross talks about is he worked three jobs to be able to buy that house on contract. And he talks about how he paid twice as much, he, he paid twice the value of the house. This is something, this is something that took place and how African Americans were taken advantage of in Chicago, but they also deal with how uh they fought back as well. Uh you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by back from breaking four minutes. All right, stand by, everybody. All right. Um, okay, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. You can uh, still register for the online classes I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. In ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. 
soon as you register you can start watching the content Back from breaking three minutes. Stand by. Welcome back to the African History Network show. Okay, uh, right before the break, we were looking at this story from um, The Atlantic, theatlantic.com, the story of the Contract Buyers League. And this deals with um, uh, housing discrimination in uh, Chicago, okay? Housing discrimination uh, in Chicago. Uh, let's go back to this here. And there was, let's see, okay. So if we look at, hold on just a second here. Okay, if we look at this piece from the Atlantic, we'll go back to the clip in just a second, Shakita. Federal policies known as redlining prevented black families from getting real mortgages. Blacks were forced to buy houses on contract from real estate speculators. Okay, let's go back to this clip. I was the council, post office, and other little pieces for four or five years. I get home at 10 o'clock every night, you know, leave home at 6 o'clock every morning. Kids be sleep, they don't see me. And when they did see me on the weekend, I tell them something, they look at, they look at their mama and say, well, should I do it or should I not? Do it with this guy, you know? I was staying in my own home because that's contract thing. Okay, we're just staging. Pause right there, Shakita. Okay, so this is Clyde Ross. He, he said he worked at Campbell Soup. He said he worked at Campbell Soup, the post office, and delivered pizzas. He said he did that for forty-five years, and he said he would get home at 10, 10 o'clock at night and leave for work six o'clock the next morning. Okay. And he worked those three jobs to be able to buy the house on contract because he was charged twice as much as the house was worth. Let's go back to the clip. I was going to work. These people who have cheated us out of more than money, we have been cheated out of the right to be human beings in a society. We have been cheated out of buying homes at a decent price. Now it's time now. We got a chance now. The contract buyers league have presented a chance for these people in this area to move out of this grip of society. To move up. Stand on your own two feet. Be human beings. Fight for what you know is right. Fight. <laughs> I really believe that you know, ultimately what we're after is some kind of communication among human beings that, that can only be affected when people can approach each other on the basis of equality. Even though you are keeping within the law, this is really war, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. The college students and I went up and down the streets and asked people if they bought on contract. And we discovered that the average overcharge was $10,000 and then computed the monthly payments so that we knew that black folks were paying a race tax of about $20,000 per family. 
you would just go to their house and ask them if you're on a contract. Someone say, I don't know, some of them didn't want to talk to you. And they, they would say, no, I'm on a mortgage. But when they bring the paper, I know it wasn't on a mortgage because that's what I had, a piece of paper. Everybody practically was on contract. People on the west side and the south side were being blamed for things that were not of their own making. This is the best example I can think of of institutional racism. White folks created the ghetto. And it drives me crazy today even that we don't admit that. It, pa- pause it right there, Shakita. Pause right there. The contract buyers week, oh. and during the past pa- year, the pa- league right began there. urging Shikita, stop large the numbers of buyers to withhold the payments on their contract. By withholding the payments, the league has managed to renegotiate, enabling the buyer to build equity and saving him an average of ten thousand dollars. There were five hundred and fifty families in the payment strike. People knew how to handle pickets. People knew how to handle you telling their neighbors. But when you're hitting them in the pocketbook with a payment strike, that was serious business. They said, well, you got to pay this money at 268 a month. No, nah, we ain't paying you nothing until you get this contract right. He came up, rang the bell, still in bed. And the wife went to the door and they served her with a paper. And then they came on in. What did they say to you? They said they were going to Victor's. And how is your, where's your furniture now? Out on the street. What do you plan to do? Do you believe that you should forward it and pay it like you were doing before? No, I won't. I won't give them the money. We just want to get a fair price for the house, you know, and we want the moment where we can have ownership of the house. And the contract violated brought us to a point where we can understand that uh, we can do something about this. The people of the CBL have come together. No matter what happens, we are fighting for one thing. That is justice. And believe me, as long as we stick together and keep growing in large numbers like we've done now, something's got to happen. own house because I worked for white people when I was in the South and they had beautiful homes and I always said one day I was going to have me one and I finally did. The house was paid for. No more fight of losing it. It felt good. It really felt good. Okay, pause it right there, Shakita. Okay, after after a year long struggle, the payment strike came to an end. Maddie Lewis, Ethel Weatherspoon, and Clyde Ross renegotiated and gained ownership of their homes. Uh, this was uh, part of the Contract Buyers League um, in Chicago. Okay, um, okay, go. B- let's see here. Okay, we're out of time here. Let's see. Um, Okay, so 106 out of 552 striking families successfully renegotiated. 106 uh, out of 552 um, striking families successfully renegotiated. Many others lost their homes and left North Lawndale, okay, in Illinois. Now, OK, just one second. OK, the the Chicago, the Contract Buyers League hoped to set a nationwide precedent for fair housing. They filed two federal lawsuits claiming discrimination after years in court. They lost both of the lawsuits. OK, after years in court, they lost uh, they lost both of the lawsuits. But many of them were able to actually buy homes on uh, uh, with more uh, get uh, traditional mortgages. Now, today. Um, and this piece is from about 2014. Uh, today, North Lawndale is one of the uh, is one of Chicago's poorest neighborhoods. The unemployment rate is 18.6 percent at the time back in 2014. Forty two percent of residents in North Lawndale live below the poverty line. 
Okay. And, and, and this is now one in five homes in North Lawndale in 2014 was also vacant. All right. Now this is an example of how these, um, uh, how systemic racism locks African-Americans out of generational wealth and accumulating wealth. And keep in mind, there was, uh, there was one, uh, uh, line in that, uh, in that clip where it was a guy who said white people created the ghetto white people created the ghetto and the federal government the federal government helped create the ghetto as well okay uh those watching on facebook and youtube keep watching we're going to talk a little bit about when dr king went to chicago to fight for fair housing and we'll talk also about Arturo schomburg uh because today is his birthday um if you like this type of information you can support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we, fo we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll come to forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Stand by. Okay, stand by. Let me disconnect this call. All right. Okay, um, I want to look at this uh, story here dealing with uh, Dr. King in Chicago. We'll look at this quickly. So I posted this uh, on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. This is from face2faceafrica.com, face2faceafrica.com, and... Uh, Let's look at this here. Just a second. All right. So um, MLK was stoned during um, Fair Housing March on this day in 1966, August uh, 5th. 1966 okay dr king we know he goes north uh and he moves into an apartment building in the slums in chicago to uh fight for fair housing for african-americans and, and poor people in general but especially african-americans civil rights icon dr uh dr king had stepped out of a car in marquette park um august 5th 1966 to lead a march against housing discrimination in an all-white uh, Chicago district, in an all-white Chicago district, when he was met by an ugly crowd. Uh, this was not entirely new to Dr. King, who had braved similar situations during the Civil Rights Crusade in the South, including the brutal attack on a march he had organized in Selma, Alabama. He wasn't there on Bloody Sunday, but he was there um prior to that and after that okay but bloody sunny march 7 1965 dr king wasn't there now king soon realized that this mob of white protesters in chicago was more hostile and hate filled this mob of white protesters in chicago was more hostile and hate filled he had scores of demonstrators uh he and scores of demonstrators would barely begin the march uh, to demand open housing when they were hit by rocks from white protesters. Uh, one of those rocks hit Dr. King and, and his aides rushed him and his aides rushed to shield him. Um, Dr. King told the Chicago Tribune, uh, the blow not, I'm sorry, the Chicago Tribune reported at the time the blow knocked uh, Dr. King to one knee and he thrust out an arm to break the fall. He remained in this kneeling position, head bent for a few seconds until his head cleared. Now, at least 30 others were injured by the bricks and bottles while some 40, uh, while some 40 people were arrested. Dr. King was not per uh, perturbed by the riots and upon recovering, 
from his injury, he said, I have to do this to expose myself to bring this hate into the open. I have to do this to expose myself to bring this hate into the open. OK, now he had come to Chicago to raise awareness of poor living conditions uh, for the city's African-Americans after having battled for racial justice in the American South from the uh, Montgomery bus boycott uh, in 1955 and 1956 to work in uh, Mississippi, uh, to, to work in Mississippi with the Freedom Riders. Now, at the time, um, African-Americans have flocked to northern cities like Chicago, hoping to escape southern segregation. But it turned out worse as many of them had to move to inner city neighborhoods with rundown housing and overcrowded schools. OK, rundown housing and overcrowded schools. Now, Dr. King had moved into an apartment in Chicago's west side neighborhood of Lawndale on uh, January 26, 1966, to demand better housing conditions for these African-Americans. Even after the violent incident in uh, Marquette Park on August 5th, uh, fair housing demonstrations continued in other nearby cities, including Louisville and uh, Milwaukee until President Lyndon Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act into law April 11th, 1968, one week after Dr. King's assassination. Now, the Fair Housing Act is not really going to have teeth and really, really be enforced until 20 years later, okay, till about 1988. All right, so uh, they have a clip of Dr. King here as well. So check this out at um, face-to-faceafrica.com. MLK was stoned during Chicago Fair Housing March on this day, 1966, uh, August 5th, uh, 1966. Okay, I, I wanna go to uh, this last story here quickly. So today is the birth date of um, Arturo Schomburg, who, um, was a historian and Dr. John Henry Clark talks about um, Arturo Schomburg in the documentary, A Great and Mighty Walk. So the Zen Education Project has a piece on him as well as face-to-faceafrica.com. And if we look at this, um, if we look at this uh, piece from the Zen Education Project, January 24th, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg born. And let me pull this up here just a second. Okay, January 24th. Um, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg born. Here's a picture of him. Okay, he was Afro Latino, Afro Puerto Rican. Uh, Arturo Schomburg said, We need the historian and philosopher to give us, with trenchant pen, with trenchant pen, the story of our forefathers and let our story and soul and let our soul and body with phosphorescent light brighten the chasm that separates us we should cling to them just as blood is thicker than water we should cling to them just as blood is thicker than water now Arturo of alfonso schomburg was born in puerto rico on january 24th 1874 january 24th 1874 he passed away June 8th, 1938. He was a bibliophile, collector, writer, and a key intellectual figure in the Harlem Renaissance. And he was a historian as well. He spent his life championing black history. 
Now, um, Efrain uh, Nia, uh, Neves wrote in um, Bien Hecho, a turtle Schomburg gave voice to Afro-Latinos. He said, during grade school, one of Arturo Schomburg's teachers claimed that blacks had no history. Okay. One of Arturo Schomburg's teachers claimed that blacks had no history, heroes or accomplishments. Now, inspired to prove his teacher wrong, Arturo Schomburg determined that he would find and document the accomplishments of Africans on their own continent and in the diaspora. Now, Turo Schomburg migrated to New York City in 1891. Shortly uh, after arriving, he co-founded the two islands, Las Dos Antillas, the two islands, which sent aid for the independence cause in Puerto Rico and Cuba. Moving to Harlem, and later Brooklyn, Arturo Schomburg is best known for his worldwide, worldwide collection of literature, documents, manuscripts, and art and artifacts from and about the black world. The New York Public Library purchased his vast collection in 1926. Today, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture New York Public Library is home to 10 million items named after Arturo, named after Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Okay, so um, here's a picture of a um, of a book about him, Schomburg, the man who built the library. This is a uh, children's book. Hopefully, it won't get banned because of critical race theory. Schomburg, the man who built a library. So if you thought that the Schomburg, um, if you thought that the uh, Schomburg uh, research, um, the Schomburg Center for uh, Research in Black Culture was named after someone who was Jewish uh, or named after somebody white. No, it was named after an afro Puerto Rican, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Now, there's a, um, so when you watch A Great and Mighty Walk, um, that's a documentary about Dr. John Henry Clark and his life. He talks about Schomburg in the uh, documentary, okay? So uh, check that out as well. Now, face-to-faceafrica.com also has a good piece on uh, Schomburg. How, hold on just a second here. Let me close these ads out. This one is how this afro Puerto Rican scholar known as the Sherlock Holmes of black history. How this afro Puerto Rican scholar known as the Sherlock Holmes of black history. This one right here, this is from uh, January 24th, 2022. Uh, by Mildred Europa Taylor for face-to-faceafrica.com. So he was inspired to discover black history after a fifth grade uh, teacher uh, told him black people have no history, no heroes, no great moments. To prove his teacher and racist historians wrong, Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, also known as Arthur Schomburg, began research on Africa and the diaspora, and over time he became known as the Sherlock Holmes of Black History. Thanks to his persistent, uh, thanks to his persistent digging for manuscripts. So a lot of times people who don't see pictures of him and just hear the term Arthur Schomburg think thinks it was like he wasn't of African descent. Yeah, he was. He was Afro-Latino. Now, a collector, writer, and key intellectual figure of the Harlem Renaissance, Schomburg was born January 24, 1874, in Puerto Rico to uh, Mary Joseph, uh, his uh, African mother from St. Croix, 
uh, Danish islands and to Carlos uh, Feder Federico Schomburg, his German father. He um, he uh, he was schooled at San Juan's Instituto, a uh, popular, popular institute, and then went to St. Thomas College in the Danish Vir Vir uh, Virgin Islands, where he studied Negro literature. In 1891, he was uh, when he was 17 years old, he moved to New York City. He first uh, went to Harlem and then to Brooklyn. Uh, Arturo Schomburg became an active supporter of Cuban and Puerto Rican independence and founded Los, uh, uh, Las Dos Antillas, the two islands. A um, hold on, let's see, we just jumped around. A cultural and political group that worked for the island's independence. When the Cuban revolutionary struggle collapsed and his home country of Puerto Rico became part of the U.S., Schomburg shifted his attention to the African-American community he was now part of, okay? He shifted his attention to the African-American community he was now part of. He began studying the connection uh, that Black Americans had with Africa and as he moved among black communities from Puerto Rico, Cuba, the U.S., and the West Indies, he collected books, pamphlets, and historical documents about people of African descent around the world. And from his collection, he wrote articles on the history of the African diaspora for major black periodicals, including the Negro World, which was Marcus Garvey's newspaper, UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, and the New York Amsterdam News. The Crisis, Crisis Magazine, um, the NAACP's uh, publication, The Crisis, uh, and Opportunity. Uh, Schomburg believed that international black unity needed an international network of intellectuals and collectors and collectors and so he helped found the Negro Society for Historical Research in 1911 and used his own money uh, to search for books and other historical documents. Schomburg was a bad brother, okay? And he's doing this in 19, uh, 1920s, 1930s, okay? 1911, early 1900s, around the, now, now, this is 1911. Negro Society, Negro Society for Historical Research. 1915, you're going to have uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who co-founds the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in Chicago, September 9th, 1915. And we, we know uh, Dr. Woodson is known as the father of black history. But uh, Schomburg was a contemporary also. Quote, we need a collection or list of books written by our men and women, Schomburg wrote in 1913, according to one report. OK, now this is this is before Marcus Garvey founds the UNIA. That's not until 1914 in Jamaica. And then Garvey comes to the U.S. in 1916. OK, this is 1911, 1913. We need a collection or a list of books written by our men and women, Arturo Schomburg wrote in 1913, according to one report. We need the historian and philosopher to give us with trenchant pen the story of our forefathers and let our soul and body with phosphorescent light brighten the chasm that separates us, end quote. Now, at a time when white historians were arguing that Africans and their descendants were not capable of civilization, Arturo Schomburg decided to prove them wrong by collecting evidence of black philosophers, composers, poets, novelists, military heroes, and painters. He curated his curated library collection would serve as an indispensable resource for the Harlem Renaissance, uh, for the Harlem Renaissance greats, including Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, 
and other African-American scholars such as Dr. W.B. Du Bois, Dr. John Henry Clark, and Elaine Leroy Locke. In 1926, Arturo Schomburg sold his collection to the New York Public Library, and after retiring from his job as a clerk for a Wall Street firm, he took over as curator of the collection at the 135th Street branch of the public library until his death in 1938 at the age of 64. In 1973, 35 years after his death, the New York Public Library branch at 135th Street in Harlem rena was renamed the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. That year, the New York Times re reported that Arturo Schomburg's collection contains representative works of every major black author. Quote, it also has a 1781 address by Jupiter Heyman, America's first black poet, copies of the almanacs by Benjamin Banneker, who was employed by Thomas Jefferson, the scrapbook of Ira Aldrich, the black Shakespearean actor, the first novel by an American black man, Clotel, or the president's daughter by William Wells Brown, the 81 uh, manuscript volumes of field notes used by uh, uh, Gunnar Mardak, uh, Mydal, M-I-R-D-A-L, in writing An American Dilemma and histories of such ancient African kingdoms as Ghana, Meli, Songhai, and Benin, the New York Times wrote. It said the, connection, the, the collection holds more than 55,000 volumes, 3,000 manuscripts, 25 archival record groups, 2,000 prints and posters, 15,000 photographs, 240 reels of magnetic tape recordings, 5,000 reels of microfilm, as well as phonograph records, sheet music, and newspapers, end quote. Now, this is what, this is what the, um, the New York Times said in uh, 1973. Today, the Schomburg Center remains the premier archive for the study of black culture and history in the U.S. and the world. So we want to say a happy birthday to one of the early uh, historians of African history and African-American history, Arturo Schomburg. Okay. All right. So check out this article here from facetofaceafrica.com, how this afro Puerto Rican scholar became known as the Sherlock Holmes of black history. All right. Okay. Be sure to register for the uh, online classes I teach uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. Uh, on Saturdays, it's from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And Sundays, it is uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so we have them um, uh, on sale right now. They're regularly $130 each. Um, understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade is on sale $60. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power is on sale fifty dollars you can register for both for a limited time only for only seventy dollars also visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com i just posted the link there so you can register for the class as soon as you register you can start watching the content now you can join us in class this weekend we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded you can go back and watch them anytime even after the class is over with a year from now you can go back and watch the entire course okay if you want me to do a presentation for your group organization, email me at AHN show at African History Network.com. AHN show at African History Network.com. And um, we know African American History Month is coming up. So uh, we can make it happen there because uh, uh, people are contacting me now. 
in ask, uh, asking me to speak different locations. I could do a virtual presentation. I could do a presentation um, in person, in state, out of state, what have you. So just contact me and uh, we'll make it happen. All right. In African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. And we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network also. Uh, current promotion is buy one month, get two months free. And uh, we have uh, new advertising packages. Uh, we have three new advertising packages as well uh, at different price points. So this is a good way to start. Um, good way to start uh, 2022 off. And uh, you can advertise with the African History Network. All right. Uh, email us at AHN show at African History Network dot com also. Let me pull this up here. Okay, so email us at AHN show at African History Network dot com. Our current promotion is buy one month, get two months free. That's going that's uh, just a very limited time only. And we have three new advertising packages. We take your 30 second to 60 second commercial, put it into the rebroadcast of these shows. We can create a commercial for you at no additional charge if you don't have a commercial. Uh, also, we put it into the audio podcast of these shows. We're on 10 different audio podcast platforms iHeartRadio, uh, Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, etc. We reach thousands of people each day across the country. So email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever, and we'll talk to you uh, tomorrow. Peace.